Okay. Welcome everyone, and sorry for the delay. Uh, this is our inaugural uh, BQE seminar. Uh, BQE stands for Brooklyn Quant Experience, and uh, we're very pleased to have as our uh, keynote speaker on the scene Nicholas Taleb, uh, who spent two decades as an option trader. He's currently a researcher in practical and technical problems with probability and studies how to build systems that can handle disorder. He's the author of the Incerto, a four volume investigative essay on uncertainty. Now we're five. Now five. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, you know that there's um, three types of mathematicians, right? Those who can count and those who cannot. Okay. So, um, and um, anyway, the, uh, the five volume investigative essay on uncertainty includes the black swan and anti fragile. The Incerto has for backup more than 50 scholarly papers in medicine, precision science, statistical physics, quantitative finance, statistics, philosophy, international relations, and war peace studies. Um, I should mention that he has 775,000 Twitter followers. And uh, if you ever inspired and uh, tweeted it all at once, it would be a lot of fun. And um, he's currently retired, semi retired, distinguished professor in the Department of Finance and Risk Engineering here at the Tandon School of NYU. Let's give him a scene. Yeah. Well, thank you for inviting us. I'm honored to be here. And, uh, uh, so, the, uh, so the author of the insert, so that's how I introduced myself. I was a trainer. Hold on, let me see if I know how to use the thing. Ah. The next slide doesn't want to show up. So, um, Okay, so the, 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 the this is a technical insert, the volume one's out and has a lot of uh, uh, papers on. Let me try to see how they see me on the. Sorry, uh, James. Yeah. But can I see myself on 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 Zoom? We see you on Zoom. Yeah, I know. Can I see it? <laughs> so, so the 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 idea is that fat tail is not just changing the color of the dress because everybody tells me, "What do we know about fat tail?" You know about fat tails. You will be writing these papers. Sometimes someone tells me, "You know, I've known about fat tails all my career." I tell them, "Okay." Let me take this paper and use variance. It's meaningless on the fat tail. This is meaningless on the fat tail. So, all, you, you, so, in other words, you're not connecting the dots. So, that's sort of like the, the, the idea is the, conse the consequences of fat tails. More than it's that we know the properties of fat tails vaguely, but the consequences. This, of course, links us to COVID. So, in, in uh, I make the, the main distinction. In the work between two domains, one I call mediocre sound. So this, uh, for this one, for my, for my, oh, okay. The the mediocre sound versus extreme sound. So, and, and how do you go back the other way? There. Sorry. There. Yeah. Over there. Okay, and then with the next one. Okay, so mediocre. Sorry for the complication. As you know, technology improves our lives. Okay, so the uh, mediocre standards versus extreme standards, two domains that have different properties in terms of how the law of large number works. In mediocre stand, it works quickly. In extreme stand, it works uh, not that quickly. Okay, so. Um, uh, and, and let me give you an intuition of the difference. Say I, I sample from the population two people, and I have a total height of, uh, say, 4.1 meters. What's the most likely combination? Four meters and 10 centimeters? 
<laughs> no, well, okay, so you know the most likely combination is two or five, two or five. And, and that's what's behind the difference between insurance and reinsurance. And it tells you the following if I'm going to take a hit in the Gaussian domain, in thin tail domain, if I'm going to take a hit, it's more likely to come from two events than one event. You see, you're more likely to get a uh, sorry, someone is more likely to get if I look at the ratio uh, two times is three sigma event and one time is six sigma event. So the 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 that's the properties of mediocre stand. That's pretty much what everything in portfolio theory in finance is based on. It must be that way, otherwise it's not going to be reciprocation. And in insurance. They have a demarcation because if someone walks into your office and tells you, you know, we lost, uh, uh, you know, $100 million last year, say, so, okay, odds are in on the experience it came from one of them. So let's play the same thought experiment randomly select people, pick two people. Uh, I did the slide before the recent billionaire inflation. Let's say that they have a total net worth, most of them, of 36 million. What's the most likely combination? What is it more likely? 36 and zero. Exactly, 36 and zero, right? Or 36 and epsilon. Okay, so that is, so in some domains, if I tell you there is a, you know, a big deviation of hazards came from one event, not series of events. So you're more likely to get the equivalent of six sigma once than two times three sigma. You see, or 12 sigma once than four times three sigma, which is the exact complete opposite. Now, there are places where we have very fat tails. The fattest of the fattest tails happen to be pandemics. Okay, this is the mother of all fat tails. Okay, uh, wars come next, and there's a fellow here, uh, Pasquale Cirillo, who uh, you know uh, works with us, and, and uh, he, he uh, I met him on Twitter. We were arguing about wars with someone, and he had cogent arguments, so we can collaborate. And uh, and then we, we we wanted to dispel the idea that you can measure that wars are dropping. We told them, listen, you need three four hundred more years to figure out that the numbers have budged statistically because the it, statistical inference is much slower on the fat tails. And then we discovered that pandemics were very very fat tails. A claim I made in the Black Swan, but without backup. <laughs> Okay, that was just uh, without backup. I mean, we figured out from the data intuitively that the Great Plague, uh, but without any, uh, without too much research, that if you only have actually, if you have the backup, you could just look at the structure and realize that the Great Plague kills so many people, and another few pandemics kills so many people, but this is these fat tails. Okay, it's not like cancer or other events. So, um, when I, when I, and uh, here I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain that once you, sometimes there's something I call uh, the, the gray swan or even white swan is, you remember GameStop where it had a big move? I looked at it, it's not even outlier when you look at it under power law representation. These are not outliers. In my book, I show like all a lot of these jumps are not outliers. They're just that you have the wrong probability distribution. And in fact, what they call black swans are not black swans. They're events that have, you know, regularity and they're perfectly compatible with statistical properties. Okay, running into someone 2,000 meters tall is rare. I mean, it hasn't happened to me, it happened to you. <laughs> or say, okay, 200,000 meters tall. But running into someone with the equivalent inequality expressed in wealth is very is common. I mean, it is possible, you know, that there are these people probably won't run into them because there are only seven billion people on the planet. The seven billion people on the planet, there are only few of them. Okay. But you realize that Jeff Bezos is probably wealthier than one or two billion. 
and the same for a few other people. See, so, so you have concentration of events. And, and with that, you can extrapolate and do a bunch of things. What are the mechanisms behind fat tails? Multiplication. It's not additive, multiplicative processes lead you there. So I know that you are studying finance here. When you, you know, later on, you want to become hot shots. Okay, if you want to have a good life with stable income, don't go multiplicated. Go multiplicated if you want to really have a, a more or bust uh, career because there's a huge demarcation between the two. And let me explain how things are. Is your professional can you scalable? Can you put a zero on it? Okay, simple. If you're the best dentist in the world, mm -hmm. will your income change too much? You probably would charge more, but you can't see more than say 40, 50 patients. You can't see 5 million patients every day. Whereas if you write a book, okay, you just don't have to rewrite it every time someone shows up, you know? You have experienced that. Every, every time I sell a book, my publisher doesn't call me. <laughs> they just do it by themselves. They read friends. They don't have to call me to, you know, ask me to rewrite the whole thing. So it's not like being a brain surgeon where every time you have to reperform. So you have two classes, dentist surgeons versus authors, for example. So, and these are the environments that are scalable have winner take all. Okay. There's something more technical, but leave that for, for later. You see, the event when you written a technical book, you can go to a technical book. Okay. Now, what's happening with connectivity on the planet is that you get scalable things to be even more scalable. Because we, we used to have a lot of diversity per square meter in fauna, but when you open, you know, uh, the, the, the world, the, 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 the islands to one another, okay, you have a drop in diversity. You have a rise in concentration. So per square meter on a continent, you have much fewer species than on an island. Well, think about it in cultural terms, and a lot of people here are from countries that are to, uh, called foreign uh, for immigration purpose, okay, or originally. So you can imagine, imagine let's say someone writing books in Hungary 100 years ago. That was okay, no competition from anyone. Maybe a few translated books. But today, culturally, it's when they call everybody the same book, Harry Potter, this is the same ugly music, Beatles. Uh, everybody uses the same language. Uh, not English, it's called bad English, different language, with a, with a, with a, you know, the one-to-one translation mechanism. So, and then Google took over the planet, you know, in 2000, that could have happened in 1950, you see, so quickly. And of course, the road from colors north to Google was very short. So will the road from Google to colors north yeah. Be very short because it's very unstable. Think about it culturally, those occupy the top, but they don't stay there. Mm -hmm. That's a mechanism of scalability. Now, why am I talking about scalability? Because in the black swan, I explain why viruses would be spreading in this environment much faster than in the previous environment. So not only you can, you know, we've had fat tail process in the past, it should get worse today. Mm -hmm. More connectivity and less understanding what's going on. Okay. So to explain what's happening in the, the great way, things were traveling very slowly. They didn't have super spreader events. There was no during the great the, the great. We played. There were a lot of plagues. There was a big plague, Justinian's plague in like uh, 500s, in the 500s. And then, of course, the great plague that started, supposedly, we don't know if it started as a continuation of other plagues, with commerce. With commerce, you get diseases, right? And, you know, that's life. So, but some villages in England were reached 
330 years after the proposed onset of the plague. They did not have dentist conventions in Las Vegas. So you send your dentist there, come back, and then the whole village will get you know, told. So it was quite different from what we have today. The, the, this is the, the American Society of Clinical Oncology. I know that because my father was a member. So, and, uh, and he would come every year to, to Las Vegas in May or Las Vegas, some other city, when they had 45,000 oncologists. They come in, spend four days. They come from between 80 and 150 countries, and some probably will be some country. They come from all around the world. They come in and they respect. So think about this. We never had that in the past. So exactly the same phenomenon of authors using everything when you had the great play versus today was causal contagion. Okay, so viral contagion, physical viral contagion would have the same properties. Now, what is the problem? The problem is that we live in a world where we have too many pseudoscientists. A lot of economists don't understand that tales. I call them automatically pseudoscientists. It's sort of like talking about a, a subject without understanding the core properties. Okay. But the same thing is happening in a lot of fields with something I call naive empiricism, mostly promoted by guess whom? Behavioral uh, economists, behavioral uh, decision scientists to tell you that, hey, you're overestimating some probabilities. They just have the wrong probability measures. So, look, this is what Ebola you know, was a thing. The economists would make fun of people who were more afraid of Ebola than uh, um, tobacco. But you understand the logic. Ebola is something that spreads, it's multiplicated, and smoking is weakly multiplicated. I mean, it's not very contagious. And definitely, uh, a lot of other diseases are not multiplicated. Because if you're not contagious, you're not, or directly contagious, you're not multiplicated. And, and sure enough, to give you another example, why we don't understand it, we have this Indian who came on TV, I mean, a lot of people came on TV to explain that, you know, we don't shut down. Um, the country for uh, uh, for people uh, drowning in swimming pools, and at the time we had a few you know cases of uh, fatalities uh, in uh, for COVID, and about four thousand people die every year drowning in a swimming pool. Something like that. Say so we should worry about that. But what they don't get is that if you drown in your swimming pool, and I'm sure you probably don't have one yet because you're a student, but, you know, assume that, that, you know, Zoom or, or, or project five years in the future when you make all this money thanks to a degree um, and you have a big swimming pool. So let's say you drown in your swimming pool. Has the odds of your neighbor drowning in her or his swimming pool changed? Okay, but let's say that someone dies of uh, any contagious disease. What can you say about the odds of the neighbor? Okay, so it's a complete different representation. One is dynamic, the other is static. So that's the first technical mistake, and it was mostly promoted by psychologists. If you read the most cited uh, person on risk, uh, uh, his name is at Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh or Carnegie Mellon, his name is Baruch Fishhawk. The biggest authority on risk, you look at the thing, you see they fall from the strap. They don't know the difference between multiplicated and non-multiplicated risk. So they say naively, people are more afraid of this than that. Not accounting for that. You cannot compare two random variables if they're not in the same class. And we had a fight with a lot of people from Ebola is not in the same class as cigarette smoke. One obeys what say Chernoff pounds. So in other words, for that number to double from year to year, okay, it's billions and billions of times the lifetime of the universe in probability, right? But for the, you know, that to double <laughs> can happen, you know. So that's an error of reason. The second, the, another error of reasoning is, is an, an aggregation, fallacy of aggregation. And that's a scaling. And, and that's sort of like my new specialty. I'm working on scaling. For n of one, 
if you see a doctor, it's not a statistical problem, it's a clinical problem. And, and with the knowledge of the doctor is critical. For n higher than one, it becomes a medical statistical problem. Okay, what we call evidence-based science. For n much, much higher than one, it becomes a statistical problem. Take out the medical, you don't care anymore. Okay. And for n much, much, much higher than one, it's not a statistical problem anymore because statisticians are interested in uh, you know, normal uh, incidence of events. They're not looking at the tails. It becomes a complete different uh, work, tail risk analysis, okay? And computationally, everything is very different. Now, let me explain to you why here, the scaling changes the structure of probability. Okay, let's say that I tell you that Peter Carr, Professor Peter Carr, the head of the thing, has a lower probability of uh, being uh, harmed in, in the terminal way by COVID, that one person, than getting into a car accident, okay. which probably helped you know, at the beginning of COVID. So one for one person, the probability of dying on the road is higher than COVID. But for a thousand people, which probability is higher? Dying of COVID. Okay. For a billion people, for a million people, you know. So I, we did this reasoning at the very beginning in fights with the. So we published, my friends and I, um, in, in that group that were fighting COVID, we published seven scientific articles in different fields. Okay. From nature physics, you can see to medical journals, to statistical journals, arguing from the beginning from that your tools of analysis are fucked up, sorry, are not correct. Okay. <laughs> the, because of scaling changes the, 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 the story completely and your reasoning. But your grandmothers understand that, they have no problem. Okay, right. So, uh, The, the, uh, so here we explain that under additive versus multiplicated risk, under multiplicated risk, the, the risk for the collective runs scale up from risk for individuals. And we continue, we can continue with, 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 a, with, a, with a thought experiment. This is why we should start with the tail. If I tell you, think about it in, in anything, in business and finance, a lot of things, right? If you go to, you know that there's now it's become fashionable to go to Mars or to go to in space. So let's say now we're going to make a lot of money, maybe by next year already, so you can afford a trip to space on, on these things where they don't have internet <laughs> and you're not connected to the Earth. And you spend, say, about a year up there getting bored and then come back. And, and the minute you enter whatever, the internet uh, reachable uh, place uh, in, in space or, you know, in the atmosphere, probably, you get the message that 500 million people die. Okay. What, you know, you now reverse engineer, what could they have died from? It must be either war or something complicated. You stop with the tail. So, and the interesting thing about the, the, the property of the detail is that the, 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 the completely different dynamics, completely different mathematics, okay, clearer, and people have much more a better intuition of the left. So, and a lot of things, and, and, and effectively, and the, the, you know, that notion of rational decision making, not rational decision making, all that breaks down if you. Introduce mediocre static trends. And that very simple distinction that we saw in the beginning, right? Google versus income for dentist. Okay. It's the same representation. The heart attacks versus COVID. Okay. It's the same mediocre static trends. So, one uh, error, I'll go very quickly over that mistake, is inseparability. The, the, you also have. A lot of people are telling me, well, you know what? Not understanding the dynamics of the processes. Uh, look, we shut down the economy for COVID. You didn't shut down the economy for COVID. 
the shutdown, COVID shutdown the economy, not, not the governments. Government was just Asian. Think about what happened with Donald Trump being the first socialist president of the United States for putting two of the central socialist agendas, universal basic income, which he did, he provided for. And the second point is state ownership of companies. They bought 36,000 different commercial brands, commercial paper were brought, you know, when the government by bonds, corporate bonds, right? So you realize you don't quite decide. And again, it's COVID that decided. You know, to shut down the economy, not us, right? Not because the people risk aversion is such that, you know, it was, that's what happened. And then people are blaming now the government for it. A lot of these uh, nuts, uh, uh, you know, because we quite, don't quite understand this inseparability. And if people don't understand also the measures, that the, the sequence measures effect. To give you an uh, example, uh, I remember a person saying, you know what? We should ban, we should stop funding the, the anti-terrorism thing, and we should stop funding these people who work at airports trying, you know, make you remove your shoes or do yoga positions, you know, in front of you know the, 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 that uh, these machines at airports. <laughs> and because we haven't had terrorist access, not thinking that the reason we haven't had terrorist access is because we check people before they get on. So it's the same thing with, oh, look, nobody's dying. Well, nobody's dying because we have measures, whether governmental or individual. Okay, so this is uh, another uh, uh, problem. Now comes forecasting. So we wrote a paper in a, in a debate with a fellow called Ioanni, who's the most cited and most influential epidemiologist currently, right? So <laughs> he is, uh, he was, you know, arguing about bad forecasting about COVID. So there are two issues with forecasting about COVID. Let me show you the first one, which is quite, I'm taking a not very fast scale distribution in Long Island. Would Peter Carr consider Long Island and fast scale or borderline? Borderline. Borderline. Yeah. This is the high variance Long Island. Okay. Look at where the mean is. What has that stick? All right. You will see the mean less than 95%, uh, 5% of the time. 95% of the ratio are below the mean. And look where the most likely is the left. So, how can you forecast in an environment where you don't observe the mean that easily? Where 95% of the patients mean forecasting is also the same. So we said in the article, not only forecasters are idiots, but those who are critiquing the forecast are idiots. And using the word idiots, I think, is probably adequate here because forecasting is not something natural to humans. Okay, so of course, we shouldn't rely on something so modern, unnatural, while facing threats for which we have been equipped with our intuition. This is why we have paranoia. We don't sit down and work on numbers because it's too complicated. And also because we would have survived hundreds of millions of years if we were, you know, uh, listening to arguments like those coming from psychologists. And incidentally, more than half the paper that psychologists don't replicate. So you can't even trust that. So that's for a non fat tail distribution. And now this is for a very fat tail distribution. Look what the mean is. This is for pandemics. Right, so it's really uh, you can no longer analyze things in terms of looking at observation. Hey, he's a super forecaster, he's a forecaster. That's not the right way to approach these problems. We know they're fat tail, we know that fat tail is exacerbated by a bunch of things like super spreading. What do you do? Masks, testing. Border control, that's it. You try to make it less fat tail. You don't waste time on forecasting. Oh, yeah, he forecast this, you got it wrong. Okay. There's an, also another problem with forecasting. So let me try to get to the slide. I missed the slide there. Um, and, and the slide is here, okay? Is that some people forecast the rate of growth? 
of pandemic, which actually made me some fail with the illusion, with the illusion that allows them to forecast the fatalities. Paradoxically, you can't. Why? Because if, and that we know from finance, if you know the Lagrange, effectively it's miscalled Lagrange, it's the exponential distribution. If I take a random variable, Gaussian, it's exponential, it's Lagrange, all right? Now, uh, here, this is a, the, 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 the same thing. If the rate of growth of something is any, Thing like say even a, 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 a exponentially distributed should not have failed or you know have failed on Gaussian but barely then the number of fatalities would be fat tail and fat tail the first thing is the mean you don't know what it is if it exists whether it exists or not it's not relevant you don't know what it is you don't observe it right and typically the variance doesn't exist so, so we're talking mean variance, shit like that, that. I mean, stuff like that that had absolutely no no meaning. So, and so uh, okay. So let's continue. And, and at the end, remind me to give you the papers to read for this. That or you can Google uh, because I haven't put them in one unit, unit, single piece. It's like series of papers. Okay. Uh, so we already have a lesson here. Then you have a uh, uh, fat tail process. Well, epidemiologists are trying to forecast. So we got my uh, friends of mine and myself into uh, fights with epidemiologists. <laughs> uh, the, the thing is, it's much more complicated. Life is more complicated, or maybe less complicated than the model, but the model is sophisticated, and, you know. And they published one another, and it's much easier to macro BS than micro BS. Okay, because nobody catches this. So, our macroeconomics is full of BS, but accounting is not. All right. So, the, uh, uh, and if you use uh, the, this is the, from Wolfram, Wolfram is someone who worked with Wolfram, right? They have to write seller automaton models. You get more intuition, and you understand also why it is a uh, fat fail and it's also unforecastable. So now let's look at uh, interlocking fragilities and linearity and, and, and put it in context of generalized risk approach. You know, it's one thing to say these calamities are occurring, and here are the economic costs, right? The, 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 economic, the, the problem over time, the world is more connected. Therefore, there's a tendency, and that I wrote in a black swan based on uh, some intuition, you know, I, I, I got from a guy called Heidenweber, and, and the, the phenomenon has accelerated since. So you have the same number of earthquakes, say, for example, or the same incidence of hurricanes, of natural catastrophe, but every time the economic cost goes up. So over time, you have had more and more of GDP going to finance catastrophes. But what does it mean? It means we're over optimized. We have a tight, uh, 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 a tight uh, supply chain and everybody's talking about it now. We were talking about it in March, of, in, 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 in February of 2020. So the tight supply chain is a problem. There's another problem. The, the, the best way to forget about it, it's too complicated. Think about it in terms of the movie theater. I don't know, people stop going to the movies, so maybe, uh, but let's imagine that, you know, I don't know if you know how, what a movie theater is, should explain, or, or <laughs> right. So the, 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 the think of the, 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 the number of people who die in a movie theater when someone shouts fire, because it's very big with a small door. So, that's not linearity for you, okay? So the market like moves together with a small door and, and that applies to so many things. And people don't be, didn't really understood that with respect to COVID. That if you overload hospitals, then you have spillover effects on other things. 
So both at the, this is both at the health level and economic level, which is why you should act early with pandemics. We were begging people to act early with, with, with COVID, and they couldn't get it. And act early and cheap when it's very cheap. And of course, it costs trillions, it costs trillions uh, and it will cost more. There's another problem with risk aversion, right? Is that effectively it's risk aversion drivers. I was saying like uh, Donald Trump brought socialism, and that was not his plan, right? Even those who complain about the government, in the end, are have a much more accentuated risk aversion than in the past, and that comes from the following. Uh, you know. Um, as, sorry, someone here has a cell phone that's has a cell phone that is announcing every message or something. Right. So the the we spend a lot on worker safety. Okay. We didn't in the past. Disproportionate amount of GDP. Planes are very safe. Why are they very safe? Because there's the the with, with disproportionately uh, uh, scared of, of plane crashes, not car crashes, plane crashes. Okay, so they are things of society that you know, so it's people are plus we have lawyers, okay, disproportionately scared of something. So it's natural for society to have certain reactions and in the future to spend more and more money on risk reduction. But just, I mean, how, you know, how much, when you put a building in New York today versus 100 years ago, think of how much more money you're spending with all these inspectors who show up. Okay. Even windows, you can't put any window. It has to be approved, storm approved, and stuff like that. It's just the cost for that risk aversion. All right. So that will increase over time. Solution to prune a network. When you prune, boom, you, you, you no longer have a problem. How was it done? This is called the Lazaretto. It's a kind of time where, how do you put a network for prevent contagion? We've been doing it for 2,000 years. Figuring out, figuring out how to separate people. And quickly, the minute they will hear of news, this is in Venice, okay? The, the Mediterranean ports had Lazaretto because we trade, as I said, you get diseases. And the Ottoman Empire, you know, had for the neighbor of the Habsburg, you know, somewhere around Serbia, Croatia. So when you go from one to the other, guess what? They have rules. Come here, eight days. They, either, they had rules for if you came from India to the Ottoman Empire also. This is seven days, right? So they had weird rules that, that and they change them all the time. That be quiet. They would, you know, they would they would uh, lift the restriction, and then the minute they hear the rumor of a port somewhere having sailors, six sailors, boom, they, they reestablished it. So and and didn't stop commerce. So uh, so the Mediterranean had lazaretos, and even by land you had the border control, border post between places where where people were subjected to these. Uh, uh, things, all right? Now, another thing people are not getting is the value of mask. Okay? So, we started fighting for masks in March of last year. Now, it's obviously everybody here is wearing a mask, except the fellow there. So, like, everybody is good, right? So, but we were fighting this nonlinearity. It's the same nonlinearity as you see in for the black swan problem, evidence of absence for 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 uh, absence of evidence. Okay, so there's no evidence masks help you. Therefore, let's not wear masks. That's the first mistake. That's a mother of all nonlinearity. Respectively, it suppresses nonlinearity and asymmetry. is always nonlinearity. The second point, and that's in the paper, about the confidence and error reasoning about uh, masks, is. The way they tested masks, they didn't realize that when you have a mask, all right, you're 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 not just protecting yourself; you're protecting others from you. 
and, and that, that could have a huge impact on reduction. So two people, you could find probability. You see, it takes two to bank tangle, you know that. So you're not contagious by yourself. So they forgot that problem. But there's a more central problem. They, they didn't, early on in analysis, they didn't get that if you reduce the viral load by 10%, you may be reducing the infection rate by 95%. It depends where, how the curve is. Uh, on the nonlinearity, that's what, uh, that's what happened, see? So, these uh, were not part of the analysis. So that's another mistake, not understanding something that, that people automatically, they didn't, uh, they didn't study uh, naive statistics or psychology in the past, so this is what they did. During the, the, the what shall I call it? The, the Spanish uh, the flu, which is Philadelphia, I think. Okay. So, uh, uh, Paranoia is effectively a very rational decision. Okay. Work with paranoia because guess what? It's always cheaper to panic early than panic late. This is one lesson from trading. You know, you're going to take your loss, take it early. Right. And eventually, you know, you're going to take a loss, so it's better get out when you can, not when you have to. All right. So, and then we. The only people, I mean, we're in contact with very few people in our group saying that there's a group in Singapore that we started talking to in 2013. And they're the smartest people we've seen because everything I'm saying now, they know it. In Singapore, it was the head of civil servants at the time. And, uh, and he, uh, you know, invited me to go there. Uh, I went, and then the other people of our team, and anybody on, co-authors, you know, involved in the anti uh, uh, naive and criticism project went there and they, they definitely had their instinct. They said the minute we expect anything that would start one, you know, we close the board. Right? We have plans for that. It took 14 months for the US administration to close, not to close, to require PCRs. You know, today you don't have to do uh, uh, quarantines. There's something called testing. You test the person three days in a row in your town, right? You have, you have PCR, you have even, even the thing is uh, the, the more effective, the, 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 the person is contagious, then there's a higher and lower risk of a false negative with the antigen tests. So instead of focusing on these things, we wasted so much time. Meanwhile, we spent a trillion dollars, and we're going to spend this year close to a trillion dollars on military uh, craft, like fighting uh, illusory enemies, or right? also we're going to spend money on the craft instead of something you pick up in the bar. <laughs> instead of working on, on and this is where we have a failure. Uh, there's a, such a gap between the classes of risk we face and the classes of risks government things we should be facing. And now when they woke up to, uh, to, to, to COVID, they started taking measures that may not even be necessary, all right? We, you know, you, all you need is flip the tail. How do you flip the tail? By, uh, by, by either you close borders or you control borders and then over uh, active testing. The United States, 14 months before they mandated PCR. But from what we call for it, in January 2020, 13 months, February at the end, you know, after uh, the inauguration of Biden. Anyway, so now success or failure. Okay. Some people here come from Asia traditionally. Okay, so you understand in the department we have a lot of people come from Asia. So spoken to people from there and understand the culture is one that has respect for the elder. Okay, they, there is an intergenerational, something called intergenerational fact. I take care of my parents, hopefully my, my, my children, grandchildren take care of me. You see, that's intergenerational fact. Uh, getting rid of old people on grounds that age no longer useful. You know, 
provide annual PL or GDP, it violates this intergenerational gap. So it's called Toronto side, and it was practiced by some societies. Now, guess what? Some primitive societies practice Toronto side and sweet. And then, of course, some people here want Toronto side. They don't only kill the elder. And the elder, they are no longer productive and would like to let them die. Well, that's not how you're going to build a society because you're going to be old. Okay. But the whole idea of having uh, uh, I mean, GDP is not the, the aim. So if you look at Asian societies, they have respect for the elder and you confirm, you know. It's, but it's the same for Mediterranean society, for classical society. Okay. Uh, and uh, what does Senate mean? Mean. What does Senate mean? The Council of the Old People, the Elders. Okay, that was the Council of the Old People. It would be a member of that Council, you have to be old, right? So the uh, that's a Senate, okay? And it's the same name for another thing. What does uh, the Arabic word title, the highest nobility title for an Arab, the highest title of society is called Pek? No, what does it mean literally? It means he's the oldest. <laughs> That's it. Okay. So seniority and age math to seniority and uh, so to wrong decide the maps, I won't get uh, too much into it, into moral decay, right? For society, because you no longer have facts with so you don't have intergenerational trust. So I'll finish with, with one thought here is that we were very lucky with the Soviet. On two grounds. The first one is it's sort of like a test run for the next big one. Okay. And unfortunately, it took us, uh, we spent trillions and it took us a lot of time to get there. But, but, but we eventually now have an idea how that these things work. In other words, we know that the epidemiologists are full of baloney, that uh, Johnny Wanis in California should not be listened to, all right? And that the CDC is, is it always sends troops after the battle, all right? Mm -hmm. So that's like, you know, that's, you know, as the Romans would say, people send troops after the battle. They say, I need evidence. I need evidence of risk. Okay, so it's like, uh, I need evidence of car crash before putting my seatbelt on. What well, is wasted? Okay. So, but then, but look how lucky we were. Imagine COVID without the internet. Just imagine if that happened, you guys probably were, don't have memories of the world or, or have no, you, know, you weren't there probably of the world without the internet. I know Peter Carr and my friend here, uh, my, our two co co colleagues here, remember the world before the internet. <laughs> Believe me, it was it very different. <laughs> okay, so we close with this on this, and thank you for listening to me. And remember one thing: there's a difference between thin tail processing and cut tail processing. And if you don't get that difference, you have no idea what's going on. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we're going to transition to a Q and A, uh, both from in the room and from um, chat function on Zoom. So, if you're um, listening in via Zoom, feel free, if you haven't already, to um, to ask away on chat. Um, and if you're in the room, uh, just raise your hand, and uh, we can begin. So, um, so um, I'm just going to see what's what's in chat. Do you see anything there? Uh, you really tell me? Yeah, I don't know. Um, okay, you want to look at uh, the questions? Okay. So let's take some in a room. One question in a room while, while Peter's looking up the chat. Okay. Should have had a plan. <laughs> oh, here we go. Okay, uh, go ahead, Zay. Yes. That was an amazing, amazing uh, lecture. Yeah. Um, question for you. How do you view uh, climate change in the context of you know, your distribution? For example, it's such a fat tail result, yet everyone sees it as a four part probability. 
Yes. Okay, well, we, we wrote the same group of us wrote something on that bill on, uh, on climate uh, six years ago that got every single okay. uh, climate denier angry and every single modeler angry. And we said we don't understand the models, but that's a message. If you want to send it arising in circle, the message in circle is if you don't know what's going on, if you're uncertain, guess what? Your decision making should be easier. Okay, it's very simple. If I don't know what's in this bottle, I don't drink it. If you don't know the pilot of the, the plane, maybe incompetent. I have uncertainty. So when they say we have uncertainty about climate models and uncertainty about the effect of, of uh, anthro uh, volcanic, uh, you know, activity, you know, on, on planet C. All right, if you have uncertainty about it, let's not lose. Not because your models say that you're pollution. So the modelers got angry with us. They say, oh, the models are sound. So I say, no, fuck you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we know that there is not, there, there's such a um, uh, discrepancy between, between, between the model that tells you you should even be more conservative. So when we put that piece at, at the Dean Circle, I, I, I rewrote the summary of the Dean Circle. I said, if you don't know what's going on, it's much easier for you to take decisions. Right. So you can decision making much faster. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we have a, a comment from uh, the chat. So it's in relation to your point, uh, Nassim, about what would COVID have been like without the internet. And um, so the person wrote, "I am not sure about your conclusion here. A society without the internet may not have had the means to travel, and consequently may have remained an entirely localized epidemic." The next question. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, of course it's not true. We, 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 we uh, I mean, think of work. Work uh, would have been done from home. Yeah. yeah um, my, my question is around, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this around, especially maybe as businesses, people too. When do you decide to optimize or really reduce risk in your work or over optimize versus embracing the risk? Uh, so when do any decision is it just uh, I mean okay in, in anti fragility we put some uh, rules of non areas all right the same story as with the masks and you can detect fragility from non linearity and whenever you're on the non linear effect you need much bigger buffer but that's uh, ho hopefully another lecture okay? okay or maybe I'll come back to uh, teaching here maybe I'll teach one seven um, half a class on uh, on uh, on how uh, you know how people don't understand some basic risk concepts. That'd be great. Meanwhile, I have my MOOC where we have my lecture on probability. So like nine lectures, nine we will plan A and B. You know, more than nine lectures, it's nine main lectures, fifteen minutes as long as. Yeah, and they're on YouTube, right? On YouTube. Yeah. yeah. And uh, by the way, this has been recorded and will be on YouTube in about a few days. Um, so yeah, go ahead. And, um, so gentlemen in, in the far back, yeah, for the staff. How much are how much is that trading? Do you think comes from just the internet? Because like you say, you're not happy. So there's like some of them that are like, like what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't hear the words what you're saying. Oh, maybe better stand up. You, yeah. You, you notice that you're on a mask. How much of how much do you think that certain traders in the market succeed because of these things? Like some people use macroeconomics like great dollars. Okay, I, I have no idea. Right. The, 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 I don't believe in in, 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 in in something called instinct and making decisions in, in markets because I can understand instinct and dealing with uh, the human being in the street because something was developed over centuries or centuries over uh, uh, millions of years, but uh, trading is new, so I have no idea. Uh, another question, yes. Uh, so I work with the data science community. Yes. And we recently kind of encountered with uh, possibly the gray swan event, uh, uh, maybe a black swan event with uh, hurricane data. Um, mm -hmm. We worked on the optimized to improve the tall ground. And typically, the wind currents for falls. Are well under a minute for the entire year. However, in the few uh, hours uh, 
exceeding the initial onset of the hurricane by the poll, way time went up past 25 minutes um, uh, on average mm -hmm. um, with some extremes yeah. of, of max wait times. Um, and now we're in the situation of every time there's a large rainstorm, like the one that is currently you know, about to occur, mm -hmm. we're not sure how to staff and uh, plan for these kinds of events. Um, uh, okay, so, so the solution, okay, he's saying something that basically the number of uh, minutes you have to wait for a call is very tattooed, you know, the maximum is 25 times uh, the mean, all right, or something like that. So, so you have that, imagine that the, 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 the average uh, height of the individual on the planet is probably the, the meter 60, imagine the tallest being uh, 25 times that, <laughs> yeah. 25 meters. Even in Russia and France, you won't see that. <laughs> so, uh, so that's his question. My answer is, um, you won't like my answer. Okay, people should not be living by the water. <laughs> and if you look at traditionally real estate prices, and uh, you notice that what I mean, I I I live in New York and in Atlanta. You see what you have these river things. People still it's cheap. And it's just, they say, well, it won't happen. And you don't, and as a, a, a business partner of mine always says, describe the fact that you don't build a house based on weather reports. Okay, so traditionally people live, live on low ground. And when a tsunami happened, you remember in the early 2000s, uh, effectively people had the superstition that the game stand on the high ground and think something bad. And they unscientifically did not like to live down there, live up, uphill, and they'll survive. So, if you use uh, extreme value theory, you would notice that the record would always be exceeded. That's another uh, logical mistake people often make by taking the past maximum, like the high water mark that the Egyptians were using, would be exceeded. Okay, so the idea is that fewer people should be living by the water. And those who still want to live by the water, it's their problem. Okay. Yeah. It's not a problem of society to support it because basically they're getting free ride off of us. Okay, we're, we're, we're. so the, the, the coastal areas, but if you take real estate prices in Geneva or Zurich, today by the water is high or high. Look what they were a century ago. People do not want to be down there. And for, you know, or visibly you know, sexual reasons they, they develop that. So that's that's my structural answer. I don't know about the short-term answer for staffing your 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 office. Okay. Make it play to you know be like to take a paranoid type approach and over staff for some events. Uh, you, you must also overstaff because uh, if you know, for example, let me tell you what the, 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 the touch do is they put a huge buffer knowing that the, the distribution of uh, water levels is plateau and they have a huge buffer. And actually, extreme value theory was born you know, in the Netherlands. Yeah. Basically, all, all these studies of there were out of necessity. <laughs> how high should, should our protection be? So the redundancy should not be looked upon as a waste. So hire a lot of people and just give them sandwiches, uh, you know, to, or something, or give them, uh, make them play chess during the day or something like that. Or watch YouTube <laughs> videos. Or watch YouTube videos, video, right? Right? Right. So, right. so stack more people. That's a, a tactical answer. But a more structural answer is people should not live by the water. Okay. We have a question. Uh, from uh, Zoom chat. So it's about uh, Evergrande systemic risk. And uh, the person is asking if it's a potential black swan event. Uh, no, that's nothing. There's no black swan in, in the cycle of firms borrowing. And then when interest rates are low, which is already experiencing today, mm -hmm. people borrow. Okay. And, then, uh, and then as interest rates get lower, uh, you know, they, they sell their mother for the basic point. They take all kind of risk because they want to produce steady returns. 
and uh, and and be on a Bloomberg list of billionaires, and then sure enough, they blow up. That's that's as old as the world. I, I've seen that cycle maybe five times in my career. I've been in finance. I'm almost as old as Peter. So I've been in finance for years, right? and I've seen cycles come and go. I've seen cycles. And then they blow up and they don't it last in 2008 or 2009 and they'll do it they'll do it again soon so but the interesting thing is when interest rates are low you start having crazy ideas masquerading as genius like uh, bitcoin bitcoin uh, is just a product of interest rates they said nothing else so since you mentioned bitcoin yeah. um also in the chat the question is can we use the tail hedging strategy on crypto markets to cut fat tails no, <laughs> I mean, stay out of it if you want to have any brain on top of me, stay out of crypto. I mean, it could be a good crypto, a good, good digital currency, uh, intelligently made, yes, but not that crap, right? All right. So, and plus, nobody's using it for, for uh, the, the, the idea of a blockchain ledger is not being used because, you know, I have a paper uh, on Bitcoin. Okay, so that answers a lot of. Uh, Go ahead. Yes. Uh, what's your view on uh, kind of the financial markets? There's systematic sellers of volatility, they got money with an option, uh, which backtrack back does pretty well, probably most lifetimes okay. Um, whereas, you know, in addition, people who buy tail options burn premiums for a lot of times as well. So, would you disagree with that? Strategy? No, let me tell you, let me tell you about uh, selling tail, selling as a money option is okay. I mean, I, I like selling as a money option because. The risk is linear and uh, selling sales. I've been long time in the market. The problem is you have survivorship bias. You don't see all the tail sellers that have been uh, blown up. Like in 1987, 1987, about the entire city of Chicago was blown up, okay? <laughs> including a firm called that disappeared called First Options of Chicago that was owned by Continental Illinois, owned by the government that also disappeared. So you don't realize that the, the, the business plus, forget about options, who sells tail? Bankers. There's an industry called uh, savings and loans that was entirely wiped out from tail, 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 tail selling, right? And then, so if you look at cumulatively, these people who sell tail will disappear. And every time, every four or five years, I got some, New generation of people who say, "Look, you know, you don't understand. Your the world has changed, and you can sell tail." Including that Indian Bernanke, who was the Federal Reserve uh, Chair, who said it's a great moderation to sell the tail. Mm. Okay. All right. I think we can wrap up the Q and A session. So thanks everyone for coming. Right. Let's give a final round of applause. And thank you. Thank you. I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, <clears throat> and, okay, bye.